go ahead and get, get started here. Uh oh. That's not going to work already. It's too loud. <laughs> you can hear me real good. You're electric. <laughs> that might be a problem. Very technical work. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I got to meet this gentleman. What? How many years now? I've been doing it for a couple, couple, years, ago. couple of years ago. And this guy here has got a good story to tell. And on the P47. And I'll let you know. Uh, how old are you? 93 and a half. 93 and a half. <laughs> so we go back. But hey, like I tell everybody here, we don't talk about age, all right? No. No, I've we'll got just to keep on going. I've already got it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, nice having you with us. I'm glad to be here. I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> yeah. Let me introduce Jerry. It's my daughter. She's the technical person in the household. Mm -hmm. and she takes care of everything. Like the computer. Cooking. <laughs> All that good stuff. Uh, like I just told you, I'm 93 and a half. I even brought a cup here with me because I thought it was the right place to announce what's on the cup. It says at my age, I've seen it all, done it all, and heard it all. I just can't remember it all. You serve me tea in that every day. Well, I probably would put a martini in there if you let me. <laughs> Let's see. I guess that's good. I've kind of covered the ground there. I'm going to take you back 75 years. And you've got the picture there. I graduated high school in 1942. And I joined the Army. First chance I had in 1943. Of course, that was the Army Air Corps at that time. And I asked for it, and I got it. I didn't want to go in there any other branch of the service at that time. Uh, okay, they sent me to Miami finally for basic training. You've got a picture of that there. Yeah, all I got was get to move. <laughs> Just enter. enter. I, I'm hitting enter. Space bar. Space bar? Left click. <laughs> okay, here comes the expert. <laughs> I'm glad we got him here. Okay. That's what I look like when I got out of high school and uh, went to the induction center out on Long Island. And the next thing I knew, I was in Miami taking basic training. So that's a picture of Miami. That's the intercoastal waterway behind me. And uh, when Tom, I was from? there, where did you grow up? Green Bar Hotel. Where'd you grow up, Daddy? Huh? The gentleman asked where you grew up. I was born in East Orange, New Jersey, and traveled all over the United States ever since then. Okay. My dad worked for the Remington Rand at the time, and he traveled, and he probably lived in my home. Maybe six or eight different states. And I was 
at the beginning of my travels. I did a lot since then. But uh, the basic training, I remember a couple of things. They put us up in the Green Bar Hotel, and I remember the drill sergeant we had. His name was Cinco. In your imagination now. <laughs> uh, it wasn't very long before somebody yelled out the upstairs window, hey, Stinko. <laughs> he did not have a sense of humor. <laughs> he came up the chair, stairs like he was on fire. And of course, nobody's going to say who said it. <laughs> so we suffered a couple of days of very, very rough basic training on account of that one comment. But I always said it. That happened, and uh, we had a lot of people give us a talk on the golf course out there. It was part of our basic training. And I always said that's where I saw the first flight since my induction. And we had a guy named Mel there, and we were having somebody speak to us. And, and uh, it happened every day. We settled down in the grass and everything, and all of a sudden Mel came straight up in the air. He sat in bed in the vans, red hands. And he took off down the fairway, shedding his clothes as he went. <laughs> and I'll never forget that sight. From there, we went to Kansas City very short time. I went to school there, uh, took a short course in probably the electrical parts of the P-47. And uh, they sent us on to Lincoln, Nebraska, where they had a, I'll read it, the Lincoln Army Airfield was constructed in 1942 on the former Lincoln Municipal Airport. The 2,750-acre property was leased to the Army by the city of Lincoln. The base provided technical training for aircraft mechanics, basic training for Army aviation cadets and his overseas deployment area for bombardment through fighter squadrons. It was one of 11 U.S. Army Air Force training centers built in Nebraska due to World War II. So, you got the next picture there? Uh, that was a friend of mine, George Levagio, doing our basic training. That plane, I particularly took that picture of it because it was flowing by a fellow that I knew uh, and I also knew the crew chief. His name was uh, Lieutenant Talmadge Ambrose. He became an ace, almost became an ace. He got four stars on the plane and one half a star and he never got the other half so they never, never said he was really an ace. But uh, he was a good guy, and his crew chief lived in the same tent that I did uh, for a long time. See if you get that next one. I just took a picture of the year P-47. That's everything that was inside of P-47, right under the skin. And I learned a whole lot from it, but uh, they made several different models of that. I don't know whether we got that page like this one here. Right there, yes. Yeah. I think that was a P-47D RA. And it uh, could have been the next one, but I think that's the one that it was. It was one of the first bubble canopy <coughs> P-47 they made. Its specs on it were wingspan was 40 feet 9 inches. The length was 36 feet 2 inches. Gross weight was over 20,000 pounds when it was loaded with bombs and, and uh, 50 caliber ammunition. Had a supercharged engine on it, uh, 2800 Whitney, 18 cylinders, cool radio engine, and it rated at over 2,000 horsepower. Late on, later on, it was, uh, they kept beefing it up, and it reached well over 2,000 pounds. The ceiling was 
between 40 and 43,000 feet. So it was quite a plane. Uh, got another picture there. That's the cockpit. Now, that's what happens to a guy when he gets to be 93 years old. I forgot what half of those switches and things are for. <laughs> But some of you probably know, if you've ever been accustomed to looking at uh, some of these older planes. As a matter of fact, out in the museum, they got a place where they have some of that equipment set out so you can look at it. I don't know. Can you read that there, Jim? Not really. Can you tell them how many planes were built? Republic Aviation Corporation was a manufacturer. Alexander Carpelli was the guy that designed it. And the total built was 15,682. The first flight was May 6, 1941. If you can read that there, I'll just back off for a minute. Can you see it and read? Mm -hmm. Pretty hard to read. That was a page out of the book, so. Next. These pictures are from an actual the real brand new aircraft, is that correct, or is this restored? Uh, the one out here is restored. Right, but the inside, is these oh, pictures? No, that are was new? that was a original. Is that amazing? Again, if you if you're doing any flying, you probably know better than I what some of those instruments are on there. Uh, got the throttles and stuff on the far right, far left rather, and. Some of the controls on the right. The plane had water injection mm -hmm. and uh, it beefed up that engine to well over 2,000 horsepower. But uh, after I get through, if you haven't been out there, look at the P 47. You really need to go out and see it because uh, it was a beautiful job that they did when they rebuilt it. And uh, uh, some of that. But right there is out on a stand so that you can see it. Mm -hmm. Give me another one. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Well, that's an elongated strut. <laughs> it looks a little shorter than that for real. What happened was that uh, as they produced more and more of these planes, uh, they also changed the propellers on them. And as the propeller got longer, uh, they had to put that hydraulic thing right in, just before the landing, uh, but the tire. The reason was to extend the uh, strut until it took off, and then it would collapse and go up into the wing after it took off. Uh, show a problem they had. Huh? There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll never forget that. They got me out there one time riding that wing. I don't know how many guys got the spot where the uh, pilot had to break it all of a sudden and he, that guy took off usually <laughs> landed on his head wound up in the hospital mm -hmm. and so when they said, Fitz, go out there and write that wing out, I said, I don't think I can. I can't climb anymore. <laughs> and why did they do that? Huh? Why they did, did they do that? They did that because the pilot, if you look at the pilot, he's sitting down in there and he cannot see over the nose of the airplane. And if he was in there alone, they had his zigzagging all the way out to the runway. Same thing coming back. They had to zigzag it to get back in. And they learned how to do it. It wasn't too bad. Well, that was with the tail breakers. If we had the tricycle landing gear, that went away for the most part. Well, it went away when you started, when you got to the runway. You got a taxi out to the end of the runway. Right, but they're and saying this once you put the power to it, <coughs> the plane would level out. When you got it, when you got a tail breaker, when you got the rear wheel instead of the front, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, that's why it sat down like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a dangerous thing. They 
had it for a little while and they stopped using the guy out there on the way. Uh, several of them got hurt and it was because of a sudden stop. But uh, I'm going back into some of the stuff I talked about how many, before. How many here. times did they take off with the guy on the way? Take off? <laughs> I'll have to go find one if I can. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, after a few months of technical training, we were sent back to Norfolk, Virginia uh, Airport, where we began our actual training with B-47 aircraft. Uh, we just took part of the runways and stuff. It was a municipal airport for Norfolk, but I guess we did more flying off of there for a long time than they did for the airliners. But, uh, Here that I need to know if you got the next picture. Yeah. But when we shipped out, we were only in Norfolk for a short time. They shipped it to uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, and then to New York. And we went on the Duchess of Bedford, called the most bomb ship still afloat. Was a very lucky ship during the World War II. She sank a U boat, damaged another, was shot and bombed on a number of occasions and once struck an iceberg without sustaining any damage. Amazing. But she made it that I don't know how many flights she took. But uh, one thing I do remember on that boat going over, number one, uh, it was in the winter. The crossing was all wind and high waves. High enough so she, you could look over next to the but it was in convoy. You could look across to the guy next to you, the boat next to you, and you could see the propellers coming out of the water in the waves. That's how rough it was out there. And of course, you know, a lot of guys got sick. And one of the main reasons they got sick was the first day out. They served two meals a day. They served liver and onions for breakfast. <laughs> We had a lot, lot of guys lying in the rails. Sick again. <laughs> I didn't need any. I, I think I would have exploded if I tried. But uh, the next picture you get here is, uh, well, we went to Scotland, but they put us on a train right away. We wound up at Woodchurch, England, and that's where we spent a large part of our time until the day. And that's one of the tents could have been my tent. And there's, is there any more pictures of those yeah, tents? Inside. Oh, that's the inside of it, yeah. That's the little stove that kept us from freezing to death. And uh, the next one is where <coughs> we, we ate breakfast, lunch, and supper. And he cooked in that tent. And the last one was just another picture of a, a row of the tents. We were there for quite a while. Let's see, Wood Church is in southern England, the last stop before the English Channel in Europe. Um, it, it was a, and still is, because I communicated with a couple of guys I met down in the little town. Wood Church is something out of the last century. Cobblestone streets, <coughs> thatched roof, pubs, same as they were 80 or 90 years ago. At the time, at that time, if they're still there, they're probably close to 200 years old. So, uh, potato field. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking what last stop before the English Channel. I just wanted to tell you while we were there in Woodchurch. Uh, the town was down a road. Each, after the, the runway would be the middle, the road would go out like this and down into the town. And as you made that last turn, either way, there was a row of hedges, and they had cut them back. And 
big branches were sticking out of the hedge. And one of our guys, we all had a bicycle. They did not have coaster brakes like they do here. They had handlebar brakes, and he forgot where the brakes were. And he went head first into one of those hedges. And it tore him up, really tore him up. I'll never forget that. But, uh, yeah, that runway, the runway and the taxiways were built out of a Pierce planking. They also call it Marston mat. Some of you may know what that is. It's like a bunch of door hinges, great big door hinges put together with a rod. And they built a whole field out of it. And that was in England? Yeah. That was in Woodchurch in England. They built it on a potato field. And I went back years later, and it had turned back into a potato field again. It just tore up those runways, and that, that was almost left. The next picture is a picture of my plane that I crew chief. And Bugs Bunny on the front, it says, Flack, don't bother me, bother me, bother me. <laughs> It was probably the oldest plane in the squadron. And, uh, what was your squadron? From that, where we were with that runway and that plane. You say something? What was, what, what was your squadron and group? Squadron was the 410th fighter squadron, and group was 373rd fighter group. 410th, 411th, and 412th. But there were more on the field than that. There were several groups on the field. So, a lot of things. We supported D-Day from that field. Uh, we bombed and straight. That's when they were on the D, about to get onto D-Day, and we supported it. Bombed and strafed every day until they could make a landing. So you were in the Ninth Air Force? Uh, Ninth Air Force then, 29th TAC. Well, 19th TAC, really. They changed TACs later on. You seem to have a memory for some of this. I know a little bit about it. Do you? <laughs> well, we got so busy during that time that uh, I got so busy and so tired that I found a great big cardboard box. Uh, long enough to contain my body, and I put it out on the flight line near the near where the flight line was in one of the revetments, and I slept in it. I filled it with K rations and water and slept in it. And the days were so long, we were very long hours in those days. If you remember, that was in June. England in June is almost daylight around the clock. How well, many missions a day would you fly? Two, three? How many sorties a day? Uh, I'll, I'll get up to that here in a minute. I've got it written down. Uh, I can never forget one of the planes I slept through in landing, taxiing up, turning around, and I never woke up. I was in that box, and it's a wonder he didn't run over me. Honestly. And another thing that happened while we were there, you've heard of the flying bombs, they had, they were all aimed at London, and they flew right over our airport. And we were setting up for a mission, and one of those came over, and a British typhoon came right up on his tail end and blew him up right over our heads. And I had to yell at the pilots and close the canopy. And I jumped, ducked under the wing, and a piece of that fell on the canopy, and several pieces on the wings, and we had to board the mission. That's the first one that ever blew over, blew up over my head. You could hear them coming. I think that's where, if you watch uh, the movie, what's the movie we watched? Longest Day? Huh? Longest Day? No, with all the guys in the tent. What you call it? I don't know. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I'll think of it. Anyhow, uh, that made us. That made us really scare those things. And 
Well, he well, just had to depart a mission, really. The next picture is Normandy, Omaha Beach. Uh, they dumped us off on the sand, and I climbed a hill at Omaha Beach, not under fire. We just moved over. And uh, I'll never forget the cemetery on the top. It was the first cemetery built for our troops on top of that hill. And it will turn you cold when you see it. It did me. And up to the top, there's the cemetery with all these guys got killed on the beach. Uh, it's still there. They moved it slightly, and uh, I guess it was in the way of something up on top of the hill. It's still there, short distance east of its original site. The little town of St. Maragliese and several other little towns right around that area still take care of that cemetery after all those years. Okay. <laughs> that's one of our, I guess that's a 500 pound bomb. It looks like one. Carry one each under each wing uh, and a big mounted tank on, under the belly to give it extra mileage, and if you put two under the wings, you always put a, a big belly tank on them. P-47 didn't have that great of getting out there and back. It improved. As the war went along, it improved some, because they escorted the B-17s and B-24s on their missions. And if they had to turn around, then the Germans <coughs> stepped right on the whole formation. If you ever read the book Ploesti, it tells about the you know, B-17s and B-24s attacking Ploesti because it was a uh, big oil section where they made oil. The Germans made oil for all their services. And, and, uh, we lost, I don't know how many, we lost B-24s especially, hundreds of them, and the people on them. Okay. The next picture, if you know anything about how they set up the machine guns, they're bore sighting that. You'll have a guy back in there looking out one of the guns, and the other guy, uh, you see him on the wing here in a minute, Go ahead. Uh, I, I like that picture because it kind of explains. Uh, we hold, held 3,400 rounds of 50 caliber bullets. And uh, that's a picture of the guys loading and the pictures of the wings full. The inboard guts are adjusted to have their bullet stream converge at 750 feet. I'll figure that out. Four guns in each wing. They're going out like this, and 750 feet, they all come together. They will literally blow an airplane apart if they hit it in the side or blow the tail off of it. Powerful stuff. And I saw a lot of that happen. They say at 600 rounds a minute, a one second burst would deliver 80 rounds to that target. Imagine that, 50 calibers. <laughs> the next picture is... Oh, that's two different pictures. Yeah, that's loading the wings with the 50 calibers. And then, like I said, it held 3,400 rounds. The Mustang, which you have one out here, also held 1,800 rounds, but it was a fighter plane, more than the P-47 one. P-47, uh, most of what it was used for was strafing the ground, supporting the troops, especially when Pat got loose and 
went across the country. Uh, they supported him straight to heaven, whatever he needed. And uh, the next one is a just a picture of the drop tanks. They're either under the wing or under the belly. But he gave them anywhere from uh, 75 gallon wing tank, 108. I think we used them 108 under the wings almost all the time. And uh, 151 under the belly when we, <coughs> when we had to use them. Okay, let me tell you about the different airfields. Those are the places. I was in seven different airfields. As, as Patton would move up, we move up to support him. Uh, Tracking ahead of whatever to bomb. And uh, each one of those had a most of them, let me put it that way, most of them had a fierce planking runway. So Reams, I think, might have had a uh, tarpon uh, from a, uh, a tarp, what do you call it, airstrip built for the Navy. Uh, the cold east. I'll never forget the cold east. That's when the Battle of the Bows was going, and we were right in the way. And we even had, uh, they had given us thermite bombs. Yeah, so we had thermite bombs to throw in the cockpits of the planes that were uh, in maintenance, there were in maintenance and unable to fly. Our orders were to burn them up because we were that close to the nose of that and they didn't know um, what was going to happen at that particular point. I got a map of it, it's not very good, it might be better up there. Well, you got a two pictures of that, Daddy, you were talking about the plane itself. Well, it's a different time and place. Yeah. That's just something that they. And it says a different time and place, more dangerous patrolling. This P 47D, and I think it might have been one of ours, carries a bomb load drop tank as it climbs near Mont Saint Michel. Have you ever been over there in France? Mont Saint Michel has a monk's place right on top. But by the time I got there, you had to go around to get up on Mount Basin, and it had places to sell one of everything that was ever invented all the way up. Uh, the sucker trap is what it was. But uh, this was a uh, Colonel Stone. He said, by then the Germans were fully aware of the P-47 abilities. According to him, our P-47 P-47s have been in combat since April 1943. Since that time, we made a believer out of any German pilot. We worry them, and that alone is a big part of our job, just to keep them away from things. The next stop was Reims Champagne. Reims is the champagne capital of the world. And instead of having Cokes and sodas under the bunk, most of our guys had a case of champagne under the boat. <laughs> and a few of them got stoned. <laughs> uh, the next one was Ricole, and that's when I was telling you. about the pilot and the bomb and Reams? I don't know. Is there a bomb under the wing? Let me see. I've passed it. Or, uh, oh, we did plenty of wine and champagne. I have it on the next. No, I don't. What she's thinking about is the bomb? The rape of the pilot with the champagne. When he got into the plane? Yeah. He said, whoopee. <laughs> he was, a lot of guys got crocked on that. It was so easy to get champagne. 
it wasn't a good thing really, but uh, anyhow it happened. The Battle of the Bones, the nose of that thing, and you can see the different places where it was heading out, the Germans were still acting. And, uh, we spent the night, one of the nights, I can never forget it, in our tent, which was right next to the road. And General Patton's troop trucks rode by all night long, all night long, going to the front. So where was your airfield? Was that that would be... Um, down in one day. Huh? Belgium. Well, yeah, it was in Belgium. We call it Belgium. In Belgium. It was right in front of the. I don't think it shows up on there, but where the biggest boat, that's a lousy map, but I couldn't find a better one. Kind of. Sorry about that. But uh, that was quite a night. Kind of scary. So that's the bulge, right? Right there? Yeah. And so your airfield was somewhere over here? Right, right in front of it. Never forgot it. <laughs> uh, Low Holland. Right up in the corner of Holland. I don't think we got a picture of that in there. But Dunlow was the last uh, station that we were in, in. Before going into Germany itself, we flew the 4th 10th Fighter Squadron, which was my squadron. We flew the first mission on German soil. The tents and everything were, uh, were in the Holland, but the Germans would build us, by slave labor, had built a runway, and it was in Germany. So when they took off, we were the first fighter outfit to take off from German soil from briefing to brief, debriefing. And Next field was lift stop. Next one was uh, the war was over. When, by the time it was lift stop, the next field was uh, just a short stay before they sent us back. But out in the museum, if you haven't done it already, uh, it'll tell you about the combat records of this. Multi-role fighter, affectionately known as the Jug, was the largest, heaviest, most obstructive single-engine aircraft used in World War II. The P-47 excelled in close ground support and aerial combat, more, more to the ground support. Its record had never been equal. And if the enemy vehicle, vehicles destroyed 160,000 enemy aircraft destroyed 11,874. Enemy trains destroyed 9,000. Combat hours, 1,352,810. Sorties flowed, 546,000. Bomb tonnage, 113,963. Those records have never been broken, as far as I know. Manufacturer built 15,682. The first flight was May, 6th of May, 1941, right up to the end of the war. The last photo I got in here, I'll read this because this is the end of the war. It's a P-47D. Uh, I don't know what squadron it was from. But there were 3,000 Thunderbolts in Europe, 14,000 in the Pacific. Many were shipped back to the United States, hundreds were broken up for scrap, and many more were given to allied nations, either to supplement their air forces or to build a new air force. Uh, they didn't bring many of them back. It was very expensive to put that thing on a ship and bring it back. And, uh, they were probably never going to use them again. That's how, that's how it wound up. 
Now, I've got a lot of stuff in my head. I can answer any questions you got. I think you covered it, huh? <laughs> Did I cover it pretty good? <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I got not to stand next to the P47 after I leave here. You. Okay. you got anything you'd like to talk to me about? I'll stand out here for probably half an hour. For